Okay. <coughs> the way I like to view the files is to see how they're organized in one another. So we can see within the hard drive, they're all there are these folders. I'm only interested in applications, so I put there, and within that folder, you can see all of the applications in here. In here. I only want Illustrator, so I click on just cl single click on that folder, and it shows me all the folders within that folder. So you can see the tree, the way these things are organized. And this is the last one. This is your application, and it does tell you that it, it, what kind of file it is, and it is an application. So now either here or here, you simply double click, and that launches the application. And then you should see it in the dock when it's launched. And this is what you should see. There isn't much here. But the key is if you look in the upper left hand corner, you'll see it says Illustrator, the RN Illustrator. And we have the default settings set right here for the way it is laid out. We go to the left. See this on the double arrow tab. These are our tools. I can view my tools in a traditional way where it's um, two columns of tools, or if I want a little bit more space, I can put on this double arrow tab, and it's a little bit more streamlined on the left here. I can also click on that tab, and I can pull them out, or I can rearrange them. So, if I want it apart from it, just click on the orange part and drag it around. So this could be any place you want it to be. And these are your tools that we'll talk about in greater depth. And if you want, you just bring it back over here and it locks it back in. <clears throat> to add functionality to these tools, we have our palettes on the right. And again, depending on how you want to view them, you can do will If I only want to see the color palette, you click on it and it becomes visible. And then if I want to hide it, I click on the double arrow tab and it hides it. If I want to see symbols, and I click here, and it shows me my symbols, and my swatches or brushes. Now, all of these are empty at the moment because we don't have anything open. So if I want to close it, I close it here. There is another menu here that as we begin to select tools for the new file, it will add functionality up here. It's a little menu bar that's white at the moment. So we have all of our tools. But in order to draw, you know, I, th I think in literal terms and visual terms, being trained as a traditional artist and illustrator, I need a piece of paper. I need something to draw on. So we go to File, New. We're going to create a brand new document. If you have already created a document and saved it, then you can go to File, Open. Or if there was something there, you would say Open Recent Files. There would be maybe five files listed, something that you've already saved that you can open from there. Or we can browse. Well, I want to create a brand new document, so that's what I think all the new Or you'll notice, <coughs> if I cancel that, there are these little scribblies and letters next to it. These are the keyboard equivalents. So for a brand new file, it's Command N or the Apple key. If you look at your Apple key, it's the key on either side of the space bar. So if you don't want to use the tabs up there, just hit um, Command N, and you get to the same place. And it says, it prompts you with a window, and it asks you, <coughs> we're going to create a new document. <coughs> At this time, if you wish, you can name it. So I'll call it um, Memo 1. what kind of document do we want. In this class, we'll be working for print, and print. 
But if we were designed for the web, maybe you would want a web format instead. If you were designed for um, video or a mobile, you were designed for a mobile device, then you would want to select one of those. And the size of the screen and options would be different. So for this class, we principally work with print. The next is the paper size. In this class, we will work, I won't say exclusively, but mostly with letter size paper. <coughs> which is eight and a half by 11. <clears throat> but if you want legal size, tabloid, or a custom size, or any of these others, um, you can create whatever paper size you want in here. So I'm just gonna select letter. <clears throat> the next, by default, it measures in points, which is a unit of measurement. For our purposes, I would just assume measure in inches. And you'll notice when I switch from points, 612 points, by 792 points is equivalent to eight and a half by 11 inches. And we'll, later when we talk about typography, this semester I will explain in the later deck what points and pipes are. So I would just assume measure in inches. <clears throat> then the last thing that we need to deal with is do we want our paper to be vertical or portrait format or do we want it to be horizontal or landscape format? There are a few advanced tabs here. <coughs> um, I'm going to select vertical for the moment. Um, color mode I will leave CMYK. Um, the color modes are for print or for CMYK. That stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. More typically for designing for the web, it would be RGB, red, green, blue. And then if you do choose to rasterize any of your elements in here, or use raster effects, we have a default setting of 300 pixels per inch, which is print for high, and it's high resolution. Preview mode is default. And as soon as we click OK, boom, our screen is filled. And you'll notice that we have a little black outline. That represents the paper size. <clears throat> the area around the paper is the clipboard, or it's the pasteboard, not the clipboard, but the pasteboard. So if I were to go over here and make a little shape, let's bring it in color, and fill it with blue. This square now, this rectangle, is a part of my document, but it will not print. The only part that will print is that which exists inside the little black rectangle. That's our piece of paper. So again, if we use the literal terms or the literal way of thinking, you have your desk. And on your desk, I have a book, and I have a pen, and I have my sweater, and I have a computer, and I have a piece of paper. Well, the only thing that's going to print is the piece of paper. So that's what we have here. But I have all these other things on my desktop. Similarly, I can, I can clutter it with all kinds of images. But the only thing that will print is that which is in the rectangle. Mm -hmm. When you save that, they remain there? They remain there. That's part of the document? Yes. Okay. Now, you'll notice that I do, now that I have a document that I'm working on, that my menu, uh, top here at the top is filled before it was blank and you'll notice that now when I select um, swatches or I select symbols there's all kinds of stuff here that I have available to me that I didn't have before when there was no document. So before I talk about the individual tools and the menu bar and the palettes I want to talk about vector versus bitmap. What we're working with in Illustrator is an object-based program. It's vector. Everything you create is a separate little object. It's a separate little thing. And if it made sense to you what he was saying with the raster or bitmap, 
is that what you have, depending on the resolution of the image, all you're doing is you're turning on and off or you're changing a grid of pixels. Depending on the bit depth of your video card will determine how many different colors or how many options you have for colors can go into each one of those pixels. So when you look at images that are photographic, that have smooth, continuous tones, that have you know, subtle gradations, that have you know, really nicely rounded, realistic looking forms, typically they're done in a program like Photoshop that are bitmap or slash raster programs. When you see images that are 2D, like this design on the cover, it could be done in a, in a bitmap program, but it's not likely to be done in a vector or object-oriented program. Now, to drive home the difference between pixels and objects, I'm going to do something a little bit different. <coughs> I'm going to come over here to my basic shapes, and I'm going to use the ellipse tool, and I'm going to create a blue circle. Okay. <coughs> and I'm going to make a copy of it. And now I'm going to zoom in, and we're going to look at this really, 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 really close. And you can see those edges are just as smooth as smooth can be. Really, really nice. Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this one, and I'm going to convert it to a bitmap. Right now, since we're working native in Illustrator, everything is vector. If I have the option, if I wish to use some of the filters or effects, to convert some of it to a bitmap. So what they've done over the years is they've combined elements of Photoshop and Illustrator. And now with, with, with Photoshop, they've combined elements of Illustrator and Photoshop. And they are distinctly different animals, you know, that now they're forcing together. And if you don't understand how each works, it can be sometimes frustrating. So I'll select this one, go to object, and I have the option here to rasterize. It allows me to convert this to a high res image. I'm going to re convert to a low res image, a screen image, to show you the difference, to see how different it can be. So I'll click OK. Now when you look at that, it's converted this to those little squares he was talking about. It looks pretty different, doesn't it, when you're zoomed way in? Yeah. 2,400%. <coughs> if I zoom back out, even at 100%, they look the same. But if I zoom in anymore, all I'm doing with that bitmap or raster object is I'm enlarging those little squares and they're getting bigger and bigger. That's why in my Photoshop class, I emphasize again and again and again, or I think I do, that once it's scanned, at a particular resolution, you do not want to enlarge the image. You don't want to increase the size of it in any way, because all you're doing is making the pixels bigger. But that is one of the advantages to working with vectors, because they are defined, the shapes are defined by mathematics, is that it keeps your file size by comparison very, very small. Um, you, they are also um, resolution they're independent, or they're dependent on the output device that you're using for the quality of image. So if I have a really high-end, beautiful printer, and I, I can print something for a billboard that's the size of that wall, I can start with a teeny tiny image and enlarge it to the size of the wall, and it will look the same. It will have the same quality. So for years, you know, for billboards, for things that even you could take a little one megabyte floppy disk and you could hold a whole bunch of information on it. And that was why they, it was considered advantageous to work in this way. Okay. <coughs> Unlike a bitmap program like Photoshop, that there's this memory model. As soon as you turn it to 300 pixels per minute, you're talking about you know, 30 megabytes, hundreds of megabytes of file size. Not just a few. Okay, so does that sort of make sense? 
Now, the other aspect of this is that if you understand that this is, in a, think about it as an object. Everything that I made here is a separate object that works independently of one another. This is something else I think that makes it different from the object where it is. So we're working with just vectors here. Now, even though these exist on the same layer, and this is going to make it confusing, because I only have one layer here. Within that layer, each of these objects are layered on top of one another. You cannot have two objects occupy the same space. So every time you create a new object, it is by default automatically layered on top of the last. You can always reorder them. But they're just by default. So for example, what does that mean? If I were to do the um, that little uh, there's a master card logo if I pick for this one and I make this red over here, and we make this I mean, yellow. And I overlap. If I wanted to make that shape, I only need to make two circles and overlap it. And what you see is what is printed. But in fact, they are two separate entities layered on top of one another. So if you can think of these as kind of a collage, you can also work like a, you can work like a jigsaw puzzle so that they fit together like this if you want. Or you can work with them so in fact they are layered on top of one another like taking little strips of paper and creating a little montage or collage of, of paper layered on top of one another Getting, when you're done getting a full blown image. Now, most of the stuff that we start with are generally fairly two dimensional, looking and flat and graphic and not very realistic. But the more sophisticated you get with the Procreate team, um, with this program, and the more you use it, oftentimes you want to create something that has more of a dimension, like some of those products that I'll show you. And there are tools to do that, but it gets more complicated. That's why we start with basic shapes like the thin paper cutouts. When we do the beach scene, when we do the mask, and then move on to something more complicated. Okay? Now, these can all be reordered. When you're saying, what if I want the red one on top? How do I do that? I mean, I can move these back and forth and all day and it won't change. But what I can do is select one, and there's a variety of ways that I can do this. For every way that I show you today, there's probably at least three or four different ways of doing what I'm going to do. I can go to Object Arrange, and I can say, we're in the front, and now it's on top. So we can move these up and down, just like you can. You have 52 cards in a, in a, in a deck of cards, and you can take one card out, and you can move it up and down. Okay. Can you go to the path, and then move the path up? You know what I'm talking about where you have the layer and then the path? No, I'm not sure. We can go to layers. And move the yellow one on top of the red? Yes, that would be another one. So I can take this one from here and now I'll move it back on top. I'll just take and just move this whole thing and move it out. And move it so that would be another way to move it. Is that what you I said there are a variety of ways of doing it. Okie doke. So that gives you, you know, the difference between vector and bitmap. It also understands that we are working on object based so that they're all every object you create is a separate entity. It is layered on top of one another. Okay, there are a number of ways of selecting objects. We have six objects on the screen. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you a variety of different ways of selecting them. And again, you can either try to follow along or you can just watch and then refer to the book and go back to it. Um, one of the easiest ways of selecting is just to use the selection tool and click and that selects it. And now you'll notice that you see the bounding box and you see anchor points and you see a little blue outline. That lets you know that it's selected. And once it's selected, you can change any of the properties of that object. You can change its fill, you can change its stroke, 
you can move anchor points, you can do whatever you're going to do. To deselect, you move outside and click, and that deselects it. Now nothing is selected. To select multiple objects <coughs> so that they behave as one can be done a variety of different ways. So everybody ready for the brand new tour? Or this? Um, one of the easiest ways of selecting multiple objects is to shift click. To select one, <coughs> and let's say I want this fish selected also. So I hold down the shift key and I click it, and it has both of these selected. These are not selected because notice that the anchor points <coughs> and the outline are not there. And if I hold down the shift key and I select this one, then those three are selected. To prove that just those three are selected, if I click on any one of these three and drag, notice that they both move. They're all three move in unison. If I wish to enlarge all three at once, I can click and drag. They all enlarge uniformly. Okay, so shift clicking and then to deselect, de move outside. And That's another useful way. <coughs> we can also use the lasso tool. The lasso tool. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you save the file format? Photo or Illustrator files AI. Just do a save it as. And it should be illustrated. <coughs> Let me <just> see. <coughs> oh, you don't have it open in the illustration. This is open in the screen of this one. And that happens sometimes. So what you need to do is open the illustrator first. It's not open. So go to applications. And then open Illustrator, and then take the file, and you'll see the, little, the Illustrator icon down here. Click on the Illustrator file and just drag it onto the, the icon of the application, and it will load it in Illustrator. Okay? So let's open it now. Just the red ones that we selected. If I click there, notice that both red are selected. You can also click and drag. And when you do so, notice a little bounding box that appears. The rubber band 
whatever you want to call it. And then anything that's contained within that will be selected. Again, when you move outside, you click and deselect. So anytime you want to make a change to an object, and that's doing is something as simply moving it, it has to be selected. When you want to leave it alone, you deselect it now. Nothing will happen to it. So if I want to change this to orange, it has to be selected. There are exceptions, that's not always true. But Now, there's also something...